Even at the best of times, there are challenges for those involved in the road freight and logistics industry in Africa. And these challenges are linked to delays, non-delivery, damage of commodities, loss of fleet and higher operational expenses. Tonight we aim to address some of these perils of transporting goods across sub-Saharan Africa with my guest in studio Tristan Wiggle who is Transport World Africa editor. Hi there Tristan and thanks for joining us for this. Uh, you write, you edit this magazine, you've got a pretty good I think big picture view and I liked to, to hear some of the detail too below the, the big picture view of transport in Africa. I think uh, Perhaps the place to start is, a, is a, a thing that everyone knows but not much has been done about and that is that South, uh, Africa's trade as a continent is generally geared to export uh, to the former colonial powers, to other countries, to China, but not intra-Africa and the infrastructure and the trade there for the amount of common interest that there is between these countries is very low. I mean that's the big problem isn't it? Thanks David for having me on the show. Uh, Yes, very much so. You know, you talk about intra-Africa trade and if you look at as a percentage of, of that trade versus the amount of trade that we do with places like China, increasingly now with the BRICS countries, India and Russia, you know, it's a very small percentage. It's literally about less than 10% of, of the trade that we do goes across the, the borders into Africa. And, um, you know, there are some significant challenges. A lot stems from the fact that many countries in Africa are, of course, landlocked which means that you know, to get goods from South Africa up into Africa, you have to go through numerous border posts to get it there. You can also use, obviously, the port of Durban to ship some goods up to Tanzania and, and Dar es Salaam and places like that. But most of the, the freight in Africa gets moved by road, by uh, big trucks. And uh, there's, as I say, there's numerous border posts. And unfortunately, what happens is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of delays at the border posts um, for a number of reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into just now. And that all adds, obviously, to the cost of, of doing business, basically. Well, well, let's take that first. And I suppose it's a vicious circle. Uh, we don't have infrastructure because historically they didn't uh, need to trade with each other. And now it's a, it's a backlog that has to be made up. But let's take those border posts. It seems to me that's one area where if there was the political will and the administrative will, it's not like building a massive road. Uh, a Correct. border post is much easier to manage, relatively, than a 200 kilometer highway, uh, for example. So why is it so bad? And I've got a statistic here that uh, the progress, the delays at uh, border posts between African countries, the improvement has been by only 30% since 1996. A 30% improvement in 20 years, and anecdotally it still sounds appalling. It is appalling. Um, it's very slow, uh, as you've mentioned. And, you know, if one just thinks of the border post between South Africa and Zimbabwe mm. and Baitbridge, and you'll see now with Easter holidays, and, and not, not just when it's peak Christmas time and holidays, but almost any time of the month you go there with a big truck, you can sit there for weeks, literally. literally not even weeks. days or hours. It can actually be, it can turn into weeks that you sit there. And that's purely from, well, there's, there's a few reasons, but um, primarily it's because, you know, there's, there's, there's corruption, you know, um, at the border posts, uh, unfortunately. There's also different systems so, uh, and different competencies. So in South Africa, on the South African side, you might have higher trained sort of officials, and then on the Zimbabwe side, it might not be at that same level. You can have um, more digitalization on the one side than you do on the other, so people are still using paper systems. But, I, but to come back to my point is that this can be fixed. It certainly can be fixed, um, and it's surprising that it's taken as long as it has. Um, and there are initiatives underway. Um, you know, people talk about one-stop border posts. Unfortunately, um, there's only a handful of those and we need a lot more of them. You know, there's talk about uh, free trade agreements, um, which should um, realistically open up, you know, the border posts and get the, the goods moving through so much quicker and so much faster. But there seems to be a lot of uh, bureaucracy, a lot of red tape. So and let's take uh, a company with one of those trucks that's sending goods and then has to wait weeks. I mean, the costs to the company, mm. has anyone calculated this? How do these companies keep going if, uh, if they're depending on exports and it takes so long? Yeah, well, if you take someone like uh, an Imperial Logistics, let's say one of the biggest logistics company, uh, uh, companies in the country, um, who, who do work up into Africa, you know, they, even them, you know, with all their sort of experience and all the infrastructure and all the trucks and all the sort of technologies that they have, even they have their difficulties. And they have to 
um, you know, forge relationships with partners and they have to do a lot of research, a lot of homework. Um, and even that doesn't guarantee that they're going to get through, uh, you know, so quickly. And uh, so they have to have a lot of backup plans, you know, in place as well, um, which, as you say, it just adds costs and it adds mm. administration. And now, talking about corruption, I mean, is it possible to get through the borders without making corrupt payments? If you are a clean company and governance demands that you are, is it possible they just won't let you through? I like to think that you can get through without having to pay uh, anybody off. But, um, you know, the reality is there are, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of guys trying to sort of milk the system, if I can put it that way. So you'll, you'll find it might not even be at the, at the official border post. You know, in, in some places in Africa, guys will set up drums and they sit inside there with, you know, rifles. And then when a truck comes around, they stop them and they say, oh, this is a, now, you know, a border post, you know, and now you must pay us, you know, whatever it is to proceed. Mm. And and these are the type of things that, that actually happen. Mm. So, um, you know, guys are trying to make money out of the system as much as they can. And also, unfortunately, for a lot of uh, South African companies, they seem to have more money and more resources. Yeah. So they become targets. You know, guys see the registration plates and they say, well, this is a South African company. I know that I'm going to get some money out of these yeah. guys if I, make it, if I make it hard for them. All right, let's look at the hard infrastructure and think of roads uh, in particular. Uh, well, in a separate program, we're going to be talking about the road rail interface, so let's keep it on the roads. If there's such demand for trade, and if uh, there certainly is this growth in Africa, and it makes sense, why can't we get the investment, even if it has to be based on borrowing to start with, to build the roads that are required? Because one hears stories about some roads simply literally being impossible. Yeah, that's, that's another challenge. You know, uh, unlike in South Africa, where we would have an alternative route, so if there's an accident or the road's closed for, for whatever reason, you know, we could use an alternative route and still be fine. In Africa, it doesn't really work like that. It's primarily you'll have the one main road, which, which could be tarred, and it might be deteriorating, and then you know, the alternative is a gravel road. And if it's raining, you know, then you've got more challenges. But uh, to answer the question, um, I think the problem at the moment is due to the sort of global economy, um, investors are very wary of where they put their money. Um, and the infrastructure that is being built is largely coming from places like China who do, who do have money to spend. But that comes with a lot of conditions. Um, and, and a lot of the time um, that means that they'll build roads but, and infrastructure, but then they'll bring in their own uh, Chinese workers so they won't employ locals and they'll build roads that won't last for 10 years. They might only last for the duration of that project. And then, you know, they get up and leave and leave us with what's rest, what, you know, what, what's left sort of thing. So, mm. but I think it's, it's very hard to get, um, you know, as you say, the loans, you know, from the, they are, they are uh, you know, the World Bank and, you know, the uh, African, Development, uh, African Development Bank does provide funding for, for some roads, but I don't think on the level uh, that we would require, not on the major sort of roads, on the sort of smaller little roads they do, but it's just not enough. Well, you, you travel around, you look at these things. Um, what kind of progress are we going to make? Well, we know what we should have, but in the next few years, we, there's talk of the, despite uh, global recession, the African growth story was uh, most countries heading along at 6 8%. Maybe that's dropped a bit now, but the, the growth prospect is still there. Mm. So in the next five to 10 years, what are we going to see? As you say, there are still opportunities um, out there for companies that are willing to, I think, hang in there for the long, for the long term because it's not going to be an overnight thing. Um, Africa has been very reliant on minerals and commodities, and we've seen what's happened with that. So I think for, for African countries, they need to find ways to diversify their economies and if we can st start trading more with each other not just in uh, minerals and with coal and, and those type of things but with you know consumer goods clothing and we need to try and get our own manufacturing uh, sort of going and then we can you know start trading more with our with our brothers and another thing that struck me in Zambia is a lot of South African countries uh, operating in Zambia you see the brand names at the, the malls and so on now the, the people who are dealing in fresh produce uh, fast foods and those things it would be very easy to grow the, the produce in Zambia, but it's imported from South Africa. And part of that, so it's an unnecessary transport cost mm. when you could source locally. Exactly. I mean, and you just think of all the emissions that that is using up in, you know, in this day and age, we should be trying to reduce that and um, upskill people and create employment that we need. Because I think, you know, Africa as a continent has relied too much 
on uh, trade with foreign countries and, and not with itself and yep. not developing its own people, its own skills. And that's, re that's really how it's, it's going to have to look after itself, you know, if it, if it wants to, to reach the potentials that it can, you know, it has to do that. You, well, there are countries which are getting it better than other countries. So which one would you choose that has come the furthest, say, in the last decade by doing the right things and shows the most promise? I think there's two countries that show quite a lot of promise. The one is uh, Botswana, mm. uh, and the other one is in Kenya. Um, and you know, people mustn't be have the view that oh, Kenya is um, facing terrorist attacks and all those types. And I think it's been grossly sort of exaggerated. Yes, there is terrorism, but I think you know, funny enough, in in Kenya, they actually sold more trucks, more heavy trucks than South Africa did uh, in 2015. And a lot of people will be like, they can't believe that, but. Mm believe it, it's true, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure projects happening there, there's a lot of mining happening there, especially like in Ethiopia and places like that. If you look at Botswana, they're really developing their coal exports, they're working a lot with uh, Namibia to set up a rail line to export uh, their diamonds and their coal from Botswana to Walfus Bay, hopefully South Africa is not going to be left out of that whole mm. arrangement, but, and also, uh, you know, Botswana does have, you know, better infrastructure, better roads, their uh, policing, so from a road safety point of view, is, is pretty top-notch. Um, you know, they've got way bridges and all those types of things, which a lot of African countries don't have. Mm. Are you optimistic about the state of transport, or are we, in 20 years' time, still going to be talking about border delays, poor roads and blockages? Well, um, you know, I'm an optimist, so I would like to say, no, we're not going to be talking about that. I do believe um, it will get better. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, as I said. Um, it's, it's sad that it hasn't um, maybe happened as fast as we would have wanted it to already. Um, but I think we've learned a lot, a lot of lessons. Um, but we need to also sort of promote more sort of national and regional interests. Well, actually, we, sh we should promote regional interests more than maybe a national interest mm. and sort of look at the bigger view, a bigger picture, and just understand how, you know, dealing uh, with other set of countries, how that would benefit us and not see them as competitors so much and just see how we can re leverage the relationship to the benefit of both, you know, and um, maybe, you know, s try to cut down on, on the amount of things that we're importing from Asia yep. and from Europe and which we could, like you've mentioned earlier, we could, we could be making here. Yeah. We just need the, the will to, well to do it. It makes sense. You say you're an optimist. Uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, uh, with faced with the choice between being an optimist and a pessimist, I'll be an optimist. The other way doesn't help anyone. So thanks to Tristan Wiggle, he's Transport World Africa editor. And thanks for watching our Driving Forward program. See you again in two weeks' time.